Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with Shane Belcourt. He's a uh, filmmaker, he's a musician, and uh, a guy that has a story to tell. He has a lot of stories to tell, in fact, and he's doing it through a new television series called Amplify. He's a filmmaker, a uh, 13-part series that you can see on APTN, uh, also available on a new application uh, called Lumi, L-U-M-I, so check that out. And Wow. She, am I ever glad I've met Shane and, and got to see uh, this episode? I'm going to definitely go back and watch the rest. There are these short uh, steps, uh, musical uh, journeys. How's that, Shane? I hope, I hope that works. And, 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 and these are, these are uh, narratives. Uh, they, are, they are personal uh, histories uh, about issues that matter. And, and, and what Shane's done is he's, he's re he's trying to reinterpret these things, um, through, uh, and, and getting you and I to see things in a new way. So, so it's about perspective and it's, it's about, it's about social justice. It's about transforming, uh, the way, uh, we see the world, uh, in a sense. And so, uh, he, he talks about art revealing, uh, uh you know, people, uh, in through, through what they do and, and, and who they are. And the, the only ways to really heal and to interpret things are through story and through art. And I just think that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. We talk about boys who actually do cry. Uh, we talk about feeling your way through the world and music and hope and what it means to be emotional and vulnerable. And, 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 and we talk about Métis politics and history and, and about his father, who was quite an activist. And, and, and you got to there's just one shot alone you've got to see for his father's, uh, I guess, campaign bus, I suppose. And we talk about interconnectivity and, and uh, the overview effect. And Carl Sagan's pale blue dot even makes it into our conversation. Conversation. There's no such thing as an it. Now, what does that mean? You're going to have to listen uh, to find out. And we we get into some pretty interesting uh, issues and topics, and and so much going on uh, in the series Amplify, but also in the interview. And wow, can you tell I had a great time with Shane? So so check out the interviews. Stay tuned. But more importantly, make sure you uh, check out the series. It's beautiful. It's cinematic. It's important. It's Canadian history, but more importantly, I think it has a message for uh, us all that, that that there are no such thing as walls and that we are all connected and similarity through difference must prevail. And so uh, there you go. Don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and speaking. And you can purchase a copy of Real Changes Incremental there. I would love for you to do that. And if you uh, wound up here listening to this interview through iTunes or Spotify, we would really love for you to leave us a review. It's so important to our success. And it's really quite easy to do if you're listening to us on YouTube. Some people choose to do that. You can do that by just giving us a like. That would be really helpful. And uh, also check us out. Uh, we we, we uh, are all, the, the library value exists on face to face -live ca uh, well over 525 or 30 interviews way more, uh, many more uh, great conversations coming up in the very near future you can advertise with us as well uh, shout outs uh, we have a, a newsletter by the way please sign up for it share uh, this with your friends and your family tweet about us uh, post us on instagram we'd appreciate that follow us on instagram we, we, i've started a whole new page now a new face-to-face -face live instagram page and uh, don't forget, you can advertise with us. We're looking for ways to monetize face-to-face -face so we can keep it going and hopefully make it better in, 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 in a variety of ways. So reach out if you're interested. And don't forget, too, I, I've been uh, hosted on a platform called Rabble, rabble.ca, for many years now. And uh, news for the rest of us, bloggers, podcasters, thinkers, journalists there. Check them out and uh, check Face to Face out there. But uh, don't touch that dial. Coming uh, right up, right now, uh, Shane Belcourt talking about his new series, Amplify. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a very special guest here with me today. And I, I know I say that 
every time I introduce someone, but I really am thrilled and honored to have Shane Belcourt here with us today to talk about his new, I'm going to, I'm going to say groundbreaking, uh, Shane, groundbreaking new TV series called Amplify. Shane, thanks for joining us on Face to Face. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. So would you say groundbreaking, Shane? Um, it, I mean, it was for me. Yeah, uh, I bet. It, it, I don't know what it is for an audience, but I guess, you know, my <laughs> film, I went to film school. So when I look at it, you know, I think like, you know, there's parts of it that are really cool. I think what, if there is something that's groundbreaking, I mean, you know, the form of documentary is so, sure. yep. so strongly established. And I wouldn't say we're breaking form on that kind of level. But I think in terms of the stories that each episode is willing mm. to tell yep. and the perspective that, that we want to take, I'd say that it's a new thing. It, 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 it's, a, it's a new thing that is becoming more common. Well, listen, I've, I've seen one episode and let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And, and I'm, I'm going to watch the rest. Like, I mean, I'm <laughs> pretty funny, actually. It's like reading a book, you know, I, I don't do this, but some people I know read the last few pages, you know, to figure out what's going on and then they go, okay, I'm going to read this. But I did watch the last, the last episode, our, our endless resistance. And, and I'm in, I, I can't wait to go back and, 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 and watch the rest. I mean, I found it, it was interesting. It's fun. It's beautiful to look at. It's uh, musical. It's, and, and that's what I guess I mean about it ground being groundbreaking. You're bringing all these sort of different um, ways of story, of telling stories together on film, including music. And I, and I think that's a, it's a pretty wonderful thing. So anyway, why don't you give us some more context on these 13 episodes, these people, these amazing stories that you're telling in a, in a, in a filmic way, but also a musical way. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, you know, just picking up on what you're talking about there in regards to the form, you know, I, I'm, maybe some of your listeners uh, have seen these two documentary series. I thought they're, I mean, I still watch every season of chef's table on Netflix. I, they're so beautiful. Um, they're so moving and engaging where if it was just a biography, like, Hey, here's this chef. It might not be so interesting, but we get to see the chef and some of their favorite and best recipes or cooking practices. The art that they do reveals who they are mm, and then they nice. intertwine what they're doing with uh, who they've, what the struggles that they've overcome. And I just love that series. It's so beautiful. And another one that comes to mind, it definitely came to mind in creating this series, um, was an HBO documentary series that actually Dave Grohl, the singer songwriter from uh, Foo Fighters, among many other things, um, um, he created this amazing series, Sonic Highways. If you haven't seen it, dig it out. It's out there in the, oh, cool. in the world. It's so good. And uh, it's a sort of biography series, but it, he travels to one town, writes a song about the town, and then in that version of that, we get to find out about why that town means something to him. So it's very personal for him. Um, and th those two documentaries were really the touchstone of this series. And it was just an idea of what would it be? If an indigenous song, singer-songwriter took or chose one piece of inspiration that is also indigenous, it could be a book, could be a poem, could be a season, could be a teaching, whatever it might be, and then they write a new song about that. Because I'm not really interested in a sort of Wikipedia page, like, I was born here, I did this, right. and blah, blah. It's like, I don't really care. I mean, I, I okay, <laughs> I care. But I, what I, when I'm a viewer, I want to be like the chef's table sort of thing, sort of transformed in watching somebody in process. Mm. I want to, therefore, then mm. get a sense of who they are. So this macro will give me the, ma uh, the micro will give me the macro. And, uh, and so, and other thing, too, is if you walk up to a musician and you sort of say, hey, so tell me why you're awesome and tell me your life story. Most of them are going to like freeze up. But if you were to say to anybody, musician or otherwise, and musicians are amazing story storytellers, not just in song, but even in between songs. If you just said, hey, what's something you've read recently that really resonated with you that had a real deep impact and connection to who you are? Then they might say, oh, my God, have you heard of this? Have you seen that? Blah, blah, blah. And it seemed like a great launching reason for them to not only create something new, but also for them to then be open to speaking about what it is that they created and why. 
So 13 episodes of Amplify of all the indigenous songwriters, there's, I, you know, I, I could pull them up right now because I hate when I forget someone's name. We're just talking well, right that's now. What's so, that's what's so beautiful about the series. You really do focus on, I mean, I, I can say just the face, but the person, the story, the narrative, their history, right? And, and also the community of that, which is so beautiful. And the combined history, I think, is the, you know, the, 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 the bigger reach, which is an amazing thing. Thank you so much for saying all these kind words about the show, man. I mean, honestly, I, I'm I'm so thankful that you watched it and, it and it resonated. And that's, you know, ultimately what anybody working on anything wants. Sure. Yes. Um, yeah. In in this doc series, you know, what we, we were very excited about is that it, we weren't really questioning uh, identity or identity politics. We weren't going into someone's like, oh, uh, you know, I, I how am I mohawk or anishinaabe or metis it wasn't about that and and i think that that's also what what i was alluding to earlier is being sort of groundbreaking or in our sense very exciting to participate with in the creation of and that is let's just tell stories that where this artist is interested about this thing in their lives now they also happen to be anishinaabe and the author might also happen to be uh cree or Mi'kmaq, whatever it might be. But that's not the central thing about the only defining thing about who they are or what story they want to tell or explore or understand about themselves. It's something on top of that. And that's what we're, I think, I feel like that's what people are resonating with when they watch the show. Before we talk about the title of your episode, our, own, our Endless Resistance, because, you know, this, I've, I've been interviewing for Vancouver Festival, Venice, TIFF, and and, and just ongoing, because I, I just continue to get deeper and deeper with, with, with filmmakers, which is so wonderful for me, but, and I hope for my listeners too, and for, you know, my guests, but um, you can tell me that later, uh, if that's the case, Shane, but, but you, you talk about at one point, kind of early on in the episode about how important stories are for you. You just want to know their stories and, 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 and you're, you're looking for ways to reinterpret them. Can you talk about that a little bit? I had Grace Dove on the line recently and talking with uh, Sarah Todd, the director of Monkey Beach, and just talking about sort of Canadian indigenous issues and uh, Michelle Latimer and, you know, Inconvenient Indian and Thomas King. It's all about the land and that comes up in this episode. And can you talk about that reinterpretation? Is that, do you, do you mean by that, I guess the question, I mean, take this wherever you want, by the way, do you mean by that telling maybe, hmm, a clearer story or a, a new way to look at it so that, you know, I, as the viewer, I'm going to learn, learn new things. You, you made that comment about Wikipedia, which I think is really cool and interesting, but yeah, just wondered if you can unpack that a bit. Well, I mean, so many of stats or headlines, you know, we know this not just from indigenous communities, but everybody's community. Um, these uh, a timeline with a this or that checklist or or reminders of this happened then then this happened then this occurrence then that occurrence, um, and when you're talking about you know a nation of people or a community, you know some of those things and the you know when we think about colonization and the effects of colonization, some of those things are quite devastating, quite damaging, um, hurtful and generationally uh, quite you know a lot of distress, um, but they. Um, the better way to interpret those things, you know, is always going to be through story or art, uh, in my opinion, because, you know, even a, you, you, someone says, oh, it's a politician. Well, you know, the great leaders that I think of are people that know how to orate, you know, a story that know how to position you, the listener, into right. the worldview of the character and the struggles that they're experiencing from their perspective. So you feel empathy and you also understand. Mm. So we're looking really as storytellers for that idea. Like, well, here's these facts. Here's these cold, hard facts or these issues, which has some kind of maybe stat relationship to it. And, you know, there's a lot, there could be a lot of difficult or troubling stats when you're speaking about uh, hi history or current realities of indigenous communities and families and individuals. But when you get down to, well, what is that quote unquote stat? What is that for you? You know, what does land reclamation or land loss mean to you or your family? Or what does two spirited um, identity mean to you and your journey as a human being? Or what does the most recent, uh, um, well, you know, recent cases that, you know, would, 
should be framed as injustice when it comes to uh, Colton Bushi, for an example. One songwriter explored what does that, you know, verdict mean to them? Someone else explored an idea of, you know, there is through um, foster care, um, you know, anger and hostility, but how do you become a father yourself as a survivor? of being removed from your family. So these are all stats. These are all things that people might know that exist in indigenous communities, but through the personal story of each of those songwriters reflecting on what those things were in their lives, we get that stat come to life. We get a chance to empathize and see it through their experience, but we're experiencing it through music. We're experiencing it through the creative process as opposed to a dict- I'm giving you a big blah, blah, but no, no, it's, it's good. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I love like, it. You were not getting that in the episode. You're getting an experiential mm. artistic creative process, right. which in the sounds of music sweep you into an emotional open place. Well, as and, opposed and Shane, to judging. It, yeah. And Shane, I, this, and this is just something I thought now the, the music, the musical side of it, isn't there something I'm getting goosebumps as I say it, but isn't there something joyful and, and, and even though that, you know, the darkest edge may be, may exist there historically. And as you say, from a Wikipedia perspective, that factual side of things, isn't there a joy? I mean, of course there's melancholy in music as well, but, but I, I, I don't know. I got a real hopeful edge out of, out of Amplify, or at least that's what I've seen so far. Well, yeah, there's, and thank you. And, 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 and you're right to feel that And that's absolutely, if there is a DNA that comes from, uh, myself and, uh, my, uh, the producer, Michelle St. John, um, y- there's always going to be hope, you know, for, mm. at least for us. And, and I know other people might take a different tact and that's, sure. and that's yep. totally justified. That's the worldview. And that's how they, and they, that's how they feel their way through the world or maybe it springs them to action. You know, hope is something that, gets me up in the morning, uh, mm. and lets me rest my head at night. Um, you know, hopeful that the, the day was good and tomorrow will be good. And I, you know, I thank the creation for the, the day I was given and hope for another right. tomorrow. So th- that's, that's just going to be my way of going about it all the time. And I was really quite thankful. And you're right too, about the power of music to not only conceptualize these different difficult factual things into the forms of poetry and lyrics and the forms of a sonic world that allows you just to sort of enter into an emotional psychological place with the songwriter. But invariably, I mean, most times a lot of songs have a little bit of an uptick at the end. (laughs) Right. <laughs> like a lot of movies, like a lot of right, storytelling, right. they just, most songs, I, I, you know, when you think about them, they just, or, or they ask a question mm. um, that makes you feel like maybe I, through feeling in this music, maybe I can be a part of change. And that's also a hopeful feeling that it emanates inside the listener. At least that's what we hope this show does. I love, I love, I love how music sticks with you in a different way than an image does, and then combine the two things together, and it, you've got something even I think more potentially impactful and meaningful in the long run. I mean, how often I, <laughs> I came, you know, into the uh, kitchen with my family, and I was, I was humming a Christmas carol. No idea, like where does that come from? You know, now maybe I heard it somewhere in the background and some crazy, somebody's watch alarm went off in the dentist office. I don't know. But, but I guess my point is, is that, and I think that's a comment about memory and history and story and all of that, right? These things that can, these dots that connect us along the way. And I, you, and I think it's connected to the, the, this question. You commented about facts and art and about reinterpreting. Would you say, that it has the ability to stick more because it's art, because it's storytelling. So the politician can get up there and, 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 and shout facts in a Wikipedia like way, or he can get up there or she can get up there and tell the story in a personal empathetic way. I mean, I, I don't know. I think I answered my own question, but go, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, especially coming out of such a uh, oral culture. I, I think or oral tradition, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the power of art is, you know, when it, this will resonate mostly with, um, with, with, you know, men who were once boys in my generation, uh, you know, and so I'm pushing 40 something. I can't remember 46, 47, whatever it might be. Um, but, convenient that you can't remember. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll yeah. forget now for the rest That's of my right. life. Um, That's right. but, uh, <laughs> but you know, so when I was a kid, you were, you know, flat out, you know, boys don't cry. You don't. Right. 
Like right. just you bottle that up and you suck it up and you shut up. You do that's in the schoolyard, that's your uncles, that's you know, you know, older, you know, your friend's older brother, like whatever. Like that is just not acceptable behavior to be emotional, to be vulnerable, to be true about what might hurt or what might excite. It's cool to be disaffected. That's cool. It's strong to be somebody mm-hmm. who bottles up and plasters over the cracks beneath them. And so when you put it in that perspective and you think about, you know, what is the power of art? You know, it's the art is just a chance to say like, no, 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 no. You're not going to get away with pretending. Why do you think we all gather around Netflix every night? You know, people want to feel, they want to go by the campfire and not only conceptualize their lives through art or to see themselves in the screen in some way and go, oh yeah, that's me. I'm also like that. Or to find hope. Oh no, one day I'm going to fall in love also, just like I see on screen. Or it's okay to be me because I see me on screen. Obviously that's the importance of having so much diversity on screen. But aside from that, what art is bringing, whether it's through film, music, you know, and everyone has a different art form that affects them the most, you know, graphic novels, writing sure. novels. But this process is to say as an older person, you know, it's okay to feel. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to empathize. It's okay to be alive in an emotional world, a psychological fractured self that is true, more true than anything else. But we have to, you know, I get it. We got to get through life. You got to get through your day. You got chores to do. You got to, you know, whatever it might be, you know, your job. And so, you know, it's not always productive to be emotional in those places. But for artists, what we're trying to do is always open up that truth, always open up the space to allow other peoples to breathe and exhale and stretch themselves out like Mm. a tree growing in spring after a big winter to go, oh, I can feel in the space. And that's obviously what art in every episode is trying to do. Truth and space. Wow, it's good. I, I, as my listeners will know, I majored in philosophy, and I think we should have a whole episode talking just about truth and space and their relationship to one another and what that actually means. Because I think there's there's a whole lot going on there, lots to peel back. Listen, I'm I'm I know already we're 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 not going to have time to get even close to where I want to get to today, Shane. But I'm I'm loving every minute of this. A quick shout out to uh, uh, we're talking about Amplify, a new series on APTN, which I just learned, and uh, Shane help me out here, is on a new application that you can download called Lumi, uh, L-U-M-I, uh, and, and the series is ongoing and is hopefully going to e- exist there for quite some time. Is that right? Yeah. So in Canada, you can watch it every night, at, as you said, Friday at 8.30 p.m. And interestingly enough, every Friday night, they're showing the previous week's premiere at oh, okay. 8 p.m. So if you oh, want nice. to catch two in one one go, it's on from 8.30 to 9. Base. It's our 8 to 9 every week on APTN, two episodes. And then afterwards, exactly as you said, in Canada, only, unfortunately, only for Canadians, it's geo-blocked. Uh, you can, if you download the Lumi, L-U-M-I app, um, it's APTN's TV app, basically for your mobile devices you can watch the show uh any anytime you want after that and but you're hoping for world domination right like this is going international isn't it eventually we are absolutely hoping to <laughs> have it uh head head into uh the netflix uh platform nice. oh, as an awesome. example so the producers um the sales agents are working on that right now so if there's ever news you would find it uh on the main website which is the show name amplify tv ca and so, how about a shout out for you to shane belcourt is it shane belcourt.com that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. That's B E L C O U R T. And don't forget, guys, if you're listening and a faithful listener, please leave us a review on iTunes if you're enjoying uh, anything that you're hearing today. I would really appreciate it. it Shane, it's what, how hard is it to get noticed today, right? And so I'm just finding new ways to, to, to remind my listeners to, to, to say thanks or to, all you got to do is hit a like button. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy. You, you, so 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 much to talk about so i need to hear more about tony and maria so here you are asking this question and i love it how do you put two arguments into one song i mean this is wonderful stuff and and, and the two arguments essentially are represented by tony and maria and i think anyway and 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 um yeah so you've got these you know is it both and is it either or is that for me to decide coming out of uh watching watching our endless resistance what what, what t- t- tell me more yeah so the episode that um 
that I guess, you know, <laughs> to inside my head that features myself, um, was a, uh, an episode that I, I had these interviews I, way back when I did two interviews, um, for a research thing that I was working on a different project. And one mm-hmm. was with Maria Campbell, a Métis author. Uh, and, uh, in one was with my dad, Tony Belcourt, a Métis rights activist. And, you know, that's my dad. I grew up in a home that was filled with Métis politics and Métis history. Um, and so the episode is, I had these interviews and I went through them and, and I, you know, I always assumed, you know, oh yeah, yeah. They all work together. They were all together and they're always, you know, they're, it's my auntie Maria and you know, they're, they're, they consider each other brother, sister. And, you know, like, you know, they're so close. And then when we started getting in the weeds of the details about the political activism that they both had and the view that they took, there was a divergence. And mm. it's a divergence that still exists today within so many communities, not just indigenous rights, but you could also put that into, say, um, uh, climate change or 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 looking for e- e- ecology rights. There's a, this perspective of, do you, as a grassroots organizer and a grassroots people, do you just sort of Try to build a protective wall around yourselves and focus on having total autonomy away from. So in the case of Métis, it would be uh, reclaiming land. And in that land, making it your communities with your own laws and relationships. Now, the other way of looking at it, you know, again, it's not one's not right, one's not wrong. In fact, they both have to exist. The other side, the tact my father, Tony Belcourt, took was about Métis rights. So rights is more of a legal uh, definition of nationhood, of identity, of land rights based on community um, in, in how a community is defined and how they exist over history and all those kind of perspectives. And that invariably gets you into working with governments, working within governments, working with the law, the courts, working within the law, i.e. lawyers and, and judges who are also indigenous. So finding ways to get yourself into a system to have that system change versus confronting the system or turning your back on the system and trying to exist despite the system. So that's the kind of dialogue that I found or these conflicts, I guess, that was inside these interviews. And I just thought, you know, how would you take both of those things and put them into a song where, you know, they're both right? It's both, you need both things as if you need, um, you know, uh, uh, you you need physical health and you need mental health, however you want to create an analogy, but you need both of these things to exist for the being Métis nationhood, Métis identity, Métis community, Métis personhood to exist uh, and to continue on forever and to come from where it came from. And so that's that's what I was trying to get with that episode. That's what I was trying to work with those two interviews. Great shot of the Métis Association bus, by the way. That's just fantastic. Like the fact that you've got those types of photos, is just, it's marvelous history. Would you say there's hope embedded in both of those approaches? I mean, listen, I don't know Maria or Tony at all, or you for that matter, but getting to know you, I think, a bit more through the episode and our conversation is is – Maria's the the critic. She's the she's the Noam Chomsky of this episode, right? She she's what was her line? Everything is fragmented, and I just kind of laughed out loud. And I mean, I agree with her a hundred percent. I think she's bang on. But is there there's still a hope there too, though, isn't there? Like, got to push back against the system. Whereas Tony's saying, "No, hang on a minute here. You got to step in, roll up your sleeves, and 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 make a difference that way, right?" And that's where you're saying we got to. It's a both end. You know, it's, well, it's, it's also such a personal thing, you know, mm, like, you know, like of course. the sort of half full, half full, uh, half empty <laughs> argument, you know, like, you know, like every personality yeah. is just going to sort of take on, you know, mine, I, I did this, there's this uh, website, 16 personality quiz that my daughter had, uh, had turned me on to and we did it together and we had a laugh and, you know, my personality of the 16 different types who wound up being the debater and uh, and we read the thing. We we're just laughing, like, "Oh my gosh, this thing has me to a T. This is exactly who I am." You know, that's just something that I seek to do, which is sort of what's how are both of these perspectives true? How are both of these things, you know, it's true to them. So how is it true to them on this side or that side? And I can get into a debate in my head about it. So many different things. And for others, it's, you know, something is felt, something is understood in a different way. And, you know, coming for, if you think about when the episode starts with, you know, the voice of the voices of Maria Campbell and my dad, Tony Belcourt speaking about loss, 
speaking about what land loss meant to them as little kids and what their parents instilled in them. So my dad, when he left Ottawa, sorry, he left, uh, excuse me, he left Alberta to go to Ottawa to fight for uh, Métis rights. His father sat him down and said, you know, son, I want you to get our land back. And mm. that was the same message that Aunt, uh, Auntie Maria's uh, granny gave to her. You know, Maria, you got to do something to get our land back. We have to get our land back. Now, here we are all these, you know, a, a generation after that, you know, I go off to film school and my dad says to me, because he knows I'm not really a politician and that's not going to be my role in life. But he says to me, he says, you know, son, we got to get our stories back. And that's something that I mm-hmm. think my sister, Christy, who's a painter and myself, even making films, we're trying, it all is a part of that fight, not necessarily reclamation. Sometimes there's a feeling of them taking something away from somebody else or a discovery like, oh my God, I'm Métis, whoa, crazy. It's not those things. These are known. All we're trying to do is sort of reclaim, as we, we, you know, we spoke about earlier, reclaiming space to exist and to understand ourselves and to be with our communities. And uh, in, in, a, in a screen space, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the saying that comes out of, you know, indig- uh, indigenous cinema, nothing about us without us. Um, mm-hmm. And just sort of reclaiming these spaces is like, I don't know, let us tell some more of our stories. So, you know, it, why Maria chose the tack of grassroots, why my father chose the tack of sort of political uh, action in a rights-based agenda. Um, both of them have their strengths and their challenges, or you know, I wouldn't say weaknesses, but their difficulties in staying true to the core of getting the land back. But if you think about getting the land back in a more philosophical approach, the way I think about it, you know, is that land, again, is that space to exist. Mm-hmm. And so what does that mean and where does that mean? Is it actually physical? I mean, it is, but can it be something else also? I think your father said there were three things, and I, I mean, I, I'd love to know when you you interviewed him for for uh, that, the research project. But I think it was change three things that you need or we need, you know, uh, the, the the change in the social conditions, a respect for who we are, and 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 one of the end goals, I guess, but the other end goal being just rights. I mean, in on one hand, Shane, that sounds kind of like wow, isn't isn't that pretty simple? Like, you know, as a, as, as a, as a country, how, how hard is that to get there? And yet it seems like we're so far away. I mean, we, we talk about reconciliation. We hear politicians asking for forgiveness. We hopefully are hearing more conversations like this one and more, more films, uh, you know, from indigenous first nation, Métis filmmakers and so on. Um, I guess I'm, I mean, I'm all about calls to action. I'm all about moving people to act. How, how do we get there? I mean, I know that's a pretty huge question, but, and I think, I, th- I think you've kind of already answered it. We get there through art. We get through there, th- you know, through storytelling, which I love, but we just got to get more, hmm, we need more space for that to be occurring, it seems to me. But anyway, there you go. Love, love to hear your thoughts. I, I mean, it's, I think the, the challenge is going to, I mean, here we have these moments that are falling upon us all. Um, no matter what background or place we're in, you know, COVID, you know, that whole thing, yeah, that right. awful goddamn thing, you yeah. know, and, and then you have climate change, you know, which, you know, I, I, I'm in Ontario and Southern Ontario and Toronto specifically, you know, and, you know, we're not seeing too many of those effects just yet, you know, uh, but other places are, and it's quite mm-hmm. disastrous. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we know the interconnectivity. And I think that's the core message of the day, you know, that ultimately mm-hmm. the only, the same thing that an astronaut sees when they go into outer space, it's called the overview effect. So the first time you're out on the ISS, the space station, looking down at earth and it's spinning at a faster rotation than we can sort of comprehend when we're on top of the earth. But when you're outside of it, looking down on it, it spins and the way they describe the overview effect at NASA is this, that when it first spins, you, you know, you say, oh, there's, that's where I'm from. I'm from Toronto. And then it spins some more. Oh, no, no. I see. You see that whole Great Lakes area? I'm, I'm from I'm from there. And then, oh, it spins again. Oh, like that whole North America, that, that's, that's home. And then it keeps spinning and it keeps spinning and it keeps spinning. And from that bird's eye view or that, you know, the creator kind of view, you kind of get a sense of, whoa, 
this, you know, the Carl Sagan pale blue dot, this mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. living being is the thing, this mother, this place that holds so much life. All the things I know and love are down there is with all those relationships. There's no borders. Everything's interconnected. You think then again, one of the episodes has Robin Wall Kim and her. She has this great expression, this great teaching about language as, you know, indigenous worldview as understood through language. So there is no, la- there is no word in, in her language, Potawatomi, for it. There's no such thing as an it. So you wouldn't say, hey, that tree over there, let's cut it down. It is a language device to have separation, to take away its right. personhood, to take away your right. responsibility to its relationship to you and you to it. Uh, you know, so there it is that you you would never call your grandmother an it, as she explains. You know, it's your grandmother. It's something that's living. So through language, you have an ability, if you change the language, if you change how you could change your worldview through language. So indigenous language has that built in. So when, you know, what is this thing about reconciliation? What is this, you know, challenge before us? This time is is reconciliation, yes, between Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities to undo the tangles and the frustrations and the trauma and pain of colonization. But it is also an opportunity for society writ large to rethink and I'm not there. This is exactly what uh, Bernie Sanders and others talk about. This is the time where we have to start to rethink how we exist on the planet, mm-hmm. with whom and how. But also, I challenge that dialogue because it's something we have to do in ourselves. It's not just a human monologue. It must be a dialogue with all of creation. And in order to enter into that space, the nation of trees, the nation of insects, the nations of buffalo, how do you coexist and honor their life and their rights? How do we engage in that kind of dialogue? But it only comes from, in my perspective, my experience, through awakening your being, your wokeness. <laughs> you know, how do you perceive the world differently? And that, it, to me, is through storytelling and art. That's how you get people there. That's the most important spe- step, to see it in a different way. And once you have this sort of empathetic, emotional, woke, spiritual, zen place then the dialogue is so much easier holy smokes i feel like we should just wrap it right there and you should start teaching a course on this stuff like that's crazy talk man it's so beautiful i mean it just talk about packing it all into uh what i don't know i wasn't watching the 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 the, the time but three and a half minutes but seriously like just this idea of of dialogue and relationship and and what, what was the language again by the way that there's no there's no translation for the word it uh, Potawatomi. That's Potawatomi. Uh, nation. It's wonderful. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, everything's relational. It's about community. It's about others. It's about, you know, there's this uh, um, Emmanuel Levinas, a Jewish philosopher who lost most of his family to Auschwitz, had, had a fr- phrase and it's, it needs deep unpacking, but the face speaks and what it says is thou shalt not kill. And I, I, I hear that embedded in that notion of there's no such thing as an it right? Mm. It's, it's all relational. We're all connected, interconnectivity and, and intersubjective, right? Experience. Everything we do affects someone else. It's a, a wonderful, beautiful thing. And I love that your series is, is, is taking us there. It's taking people, is going to take people there. And I, I and you're doing it in, in such a cinematic way too. And maybe, maybe that's a really lovely way to just wrap things up here. And again, I'm just kind of heartbroken that we're, we're coming to the end, but, but, uh, there's that beautiful shot of you and you, I think it's you, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, of this, I keep wanting to say film, but it's very cinematic, the end of the, this episode. And I'm pretty sure it's an extended and you're, it's this really slow kind of, I guess, tracking shot in, I guess, of you sitting with the television peace tower in the background, I think. And y- your dad's talking, is that right? Talking about, um, Am I ringing a bell here for you? Oh, as, as, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's it, gorgeous. It's a gorgeous shot, man. And I'm so glad you held on it. Yo, thank you so much. Yeah, it was uh, the device for, you know, that the final episode, you know, 
one thing as a filmmaker and working in documentary film, you know, we know that there's going to, you have the opportunity to have interview footage, you know, talking heads. You also have this thing called, you know, B roll or these elements yep. of the cutaways that as someone's speaking, what are we seeing? Um, you know, these shots and a lot of, a lot of B roll and documentary is archival. So, you know, old photos or old footage. In this case, it was old footage of Maria and my dad, uh, Tony. And it was, well, how can we recreate that? I don't want to just cut to it because it just didn't seem exciting to me visually. So then we came up with this device, um, the cinematographer and myself, uh, Sean Stiller, we thought, okay, well, if we just walk, if I walk around with the TV and we have a TV just scattered in all these different shots in the episodes, later in post, we can insert that mm -hmm. quote unquote archival B roll into the TV. And now, of course, because we're speaking about Metis rights and because we're speaking about the history of uh, the Canadian regime against the Metis communities, you know, we definitely wanted to, you know, it's very provocative. And it's so multi-layered to have, you know, somebody, me, a Métis person sitting now on those steps of the government's house with footage from another time, which still resonates mm. today. Mm. And in, while that happens, tourists just yes. pass amongst the building like the Great. tourists inside so the building. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Well, it's just, I mean, it's so layered and, and it's a comment on memory and history. It's a comment on telling new stories and like you said, reinterpreting them. The, the fact that we've been told the wrong story, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think, or, 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 or poor interpretations of the stories. In fact, sometimes just outright lies. I mean, I think for me, that's where, that's certainly where, where, where it takes me, but what, a, what a great device and 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 I love that Riel appears a couple times in this not appears but is referenced I think several times throughout this I re I remember as a kid being very um impressed might be the wrong word but it had a, a deep impression on me the, the the my understanding as a well I guess grade 7 we're talking a few years ago Shane I'm I, I'm 55 <laughs> so but I I actually felt like I aligned myself a little bit with, with Louis Riel in the sense that here was a guy who was really, I mean, talk about the rebellion and the resistance. And I love that, that our endless resistance is the title of, uh, of, of this episode. I was, I was on the Fernwood publishing's page, just a little shout out for them. And what pops up, no joke this morning, warrior life by Pamela Palmatier, I believe is her name. And it's indigenous resistance and resurgence. I'm interviewing Peter Finley yesterday for his film Company Town, and we've got Jerry Dias, the Unifor rep, on the phone. And 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 what's the theme? Continued resistance. Like this is like all in the last you know 72 hours. So I think I don't know. There's there's the the, the cosmos is speaking, <laughs> Shane, <laughs> and uh, it's it's it, 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 can you wrap it up for us there? This this idea. It's it's. It's about stepping in and being intentional, I would imagine, from a, from a rebellious perspective. Yeah, you know, the when you think about the definition of like resistance, yeah, I just I, I pulled it up, you know, because we were just talking about it, but the refusal to accept or comply with something. And I think that that's it's the refusal and to accept or comply with that something being a dishonor mm, nice. with something being an untruth. These are, and not like the, you know, fake news, blah, blah, political crap. I mean like deep seated dishonor and untruths that were the only species that matters on this planet as one obvious example, um, that we aren't fully interconnected as a living organism of human beings says COVID, you know, the refusal to accept and comply with these things that make it convenient to live in a sort of like consumption based, you know, a fever dream. And, right. and who doesn't want to be in that? Right. I mean, come right. on, yeah, like, you know, sure. yeah. God, yeah. I want to live in a commercial, you know, way back when, but uh, you know, there's, Something about being alive together where more of these voices are understood and unified and through diversifying the voices that we hear and see, there's going to be some pushback and some bumps and some misinterpretation, of course, but through this constant push of dialogue 
I really feel that, you know, we're going to get to a place together and it might take a couple more generations where you, you just perceive the world differently. And there's so many examples, I'm sure from you and I, we grew up in the same sort of eras, Mm. you know, where my daughter, you know, to have, uh, a same sex couple as uh, as parents is not a thing. That's not a thing. If I was a kid and I saw that, that would have been a thing. In the sense that other people would have made it a thing around us, right? You know. But so that's just one example of how I see that. You know, when I look around, I, you know, I have so much hope for mm. these coming generations who have the ability through knowledge and art and dialogue to just see the world and interact and interplay with the world differently than we have. And that's so an exciting good. possibility. Well, it is. And I love your unified voices, common and diversity. And I mean, simil- it's sim- Shane, it's similarity through difference, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's uh Wow. And, he, and to celebrate both. To celebrate and to, and the to unique. celebrate and to celebrate both. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it gets us to, I mean, in this age of what appears to be division and, and the building of walls and all these things, I mean, this idea, I just hope we can continue to have this conversation and this conversation is going to drive people to, to more action and that, and that, and that filmmakers like yourself are going to continue to tell these stories. What is it? Nothing about us without us. And I think that's, yeah, I, I, Wow, Shane, what a what a privilege, what an honor to have you on. I hope everybody sees Amplify at least a couple episodes. It's uh it's easy to access, folks. You can get to it through um I'm gonna check out this app too, because you know, at my age I'm all about the application. Indeed. Um yes, uh Lumi, uh you can watch uh it on APTN 13 part series. It's called Amplify. Uh we've been talking to Shane Belcourt today about his uh, his episode, uh, our endless resistance. We've touched on a whole lot of things. Please again leave us a, a review on um, iTunes, Spotify, one of the one of the usual suspects. And check out uh, Shane's website too, shanebelcourt.com. And Shane, one last thing. You're going international soon, but but it's for Canadians right now. Where, where can they find out more about the series and you? Uh, I think you said there was an actual site. Yeah, so it's just amplifytv.ca. Uh, Beautiful. We've been ta- chatting with Shane Belcourt here today about, about his new... Uh, beautiful uh, new TV series called Amplify. Shane, I really appreciate the time today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me and thanks for listening if you're still with us. 